Tom Barkin is president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. That means he's responsible for monetary policy, bank supervision, uh, the payment system. He also manages the IT, uh, national IT organization for the Federal Reserve. And he's been in this capacity since 2018. Uh, he serves as a voting member of the Fed's chief monetary policy body, which is called the F FOMC, which basically manages all the, the open market operations to implement monetary policy. So very important vote on that committee. Uh, prior to this, he was a senior partner at, uh, at McKinsey and CFO of McKinsey. Uh, he's, he's actually served on the board of the Atlanta Federal Reserve from 2009 to 2014 and was board chair uh, in the final two years of that, that period. Uh, he did his undergrad in MBA and law at Harvard. Uh, he is, uh, I believe, a native Atlanta. I know you spent a lot of time in Atlanta. Uh, so we are excited to have Tom Barkin with us today. Tom, come on up. And Tom has agreed to do a fireside chat, which, uh, welcome, which uh, is really what we're finding just the best format to use. So Tom, we are excited to have you. And it's great uh, to be with a television personality like you. You know, <laughs> for, another, for another 30 minutes and then, uh, and, and then, then, then we'll move on. Um, well, so uh, to start us off, I will say originally we're gonna have Rafael Bostic, uh, who's the Atlanta Federal Reserve Chair. And a much uh, better Federal Reserve Chair. <laughs> well, <laughs> conduct this fireside chat, but uh, he's not able to be here. And uh, so Tom, tell us, I know you all are good friends. Yeah. Tell us, uh, tell us how y'all got to know each other. Where's, where's Rafael today? And, uh, so, I, so I was actually Raphael's RA in college, which is a little known uh, fact. Uh, I think I did pretty well, but he, um, uh, he and I were going to do this together. We thought it'd be fun. Um, and then it turns out when it turned from remote to in person, he's actually canoeing in the Okefenokee Swamp. So he had a vacation and we just couldn't make the logistics work. So I, I thought I'd stand in. I do say before I say anything, I have to say everything that I say is my words and my thoughts, not that of the Federal Open Market Committee or any of its participants, but Raphael has given me latitude to say anything I say today is actually his thought. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, our thoughts are with Raphael. Hope he's not uh, ambushed by any crocodiles or anything like that. We certainly need him. Um, now, he, uh, he did say uh, that you are a real road warrior, that you have uh, really raised the bar on what the Federal Reserve governors and presidents do uh, you know, I know you, uh, you're on the USGA committee, uh, executive committee, the United States Golf Association. I think you're out at the U.S. Open. Uh, so he said, uh, be careful. Don't, don't raise the bar so high that they all can't keep up with all your activities. So, uh, no, well, I, mean, I will say this, um, both for Raphael and I, um, you know, our districts are multiple states. So mine are South Carolina through Maryland, including West Virginia. He's got large parts of Louisiana, Tennessee, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia. And it's great to be in your home city and learn what's going on. But where you really learn is being out, and especially during COVID, um, questions like, you know, who's wearing masks and who's not, that's a pretty different answer in my district between South Carolina and Washington, D.C. And seeing how those economies reopened at very different levels, and I know Raphael does the same thing. Well, uh, uh, absolutely. So, um, you know, it's fascinating, each of you all seeing different things across different states and being able to aggregate that up into one position uh, is just a fascinating opportunity. Um, before we jump into the question at hand, I do know you were out at the U.S. Open. Um, tell us a little bit about your work there. I know you're an avid golfer and uh, your role with the executive committee at USGA. Uh, tell us a little bit about what it's like to be an official at the U.S. Open. Uh, this is not a plant question, but we'll have some fun with it. Um, so I was a walking scorer on Sunday for Bryce and DeChambeau. And uh, what you do as a walking scorer is you keep score. And that's what gives you the live scoring that you see on the television. Um, and at number 10, he was at five under par when leading the entire tournament. I was thinking, I'm going to be there, you know, with the guy who wins the whole tournament. He then bogeys a couple holes. On the 13th hole, a streaker runs out onto his hole while I'm there, um, uh, takes out a golf club, hits a couple balls. The policemen try to catch him, and, um, and he splits the two of them and starts running directly toward me. Um, and I thought, holy cow, I am not a very good last line of defense here. <laughs> and the last thing I need is to be on national television diving to try to tackle a streaker and miss it. <laughs> Might have been a highlight reel, I think. Of. Uh, luckily, another policeman uh, tracked him down and got him before I had to embarrass myself. Uh, Bryson then double bogeyed the hole. And then three holes later, he managed to get an eight on a par four, which doesn't happen uh, much except in my game. 
And, and so, uh, you know, I was sort of joking, that's the walking score uh, graduate exam because you have to actually be with someone and count eight shots with the pro and get it right. So that, that's what it's like being a lot. Well, I had a couple people tell me to say, ask them about the, uh, the U.S. Open, but I did not know we were going to get that story. So that, that, you that, that is awesome, you real asked. time. Um, well, let's jump right in to the topic at hand for everyone, certainly. I mean, you've been speaking a lot on the economy. You've been mm -hmm. speaking a lot on, uh, on inflation. And in inflation, we're getting a, a lot of mixed signals. We're getting the bond market telling us one thing. We've got uh, supplier prices and wage markets telling us another. Um, can you kind of make sense for us a little bit about what you're seeing in, the, in those, those markets and what those signals are? Yeah, so let's start with, um, you know, when you pick up the newspaper every day, uh, what you read about and what you hear about is inflation. And, you know, why wouldn't you? Um, you've got very uh, stimulative fiscal policy. You've got very accommodative monetary policy. You've got a huge amount of pent-up demand coming out of the uh, COVID uh, quarantine. You've got real supply chain issues in almost uh, every industry, not just materials, you know, things coming from uh, uh, overseas, but also labor. And you can't get people back to work. Commodity prices are up. Um, and, and so that, you know, feels like the essence of inflation. Of course, if you look at the last 12 months of this is the PCE price index, which we watch, you'll see headline was about 3.9 percent. Core was about 3.4 percent. So there is inflation you know, in this time period. Um, one of the challenges we have as a central bank is that we think about inflation somewhat differently than most business people do. Most business people think about inflation as input costs. You know, my suppliers are coming to me with price increases. You know, what am I gonna do? We actually look at consumer prices because not all of those price increases get passed on to consumers. Um, if you think about consumers, what they really care about um, and what motivates their expectations are food and gasoline prices. Yet we look at core inflation often, which takes out food and gasoline because they're so volatile. And that in most consumers are interested in what inflation looks like today. We're actually trying to look at it over a longer time frame and ask the question, where's inflation headed tomorrow? So there's a real difference in how we look at it. And if you look at where it's headed tomorrow, a couple numbers that at least give me some comfort. Um, if you look at the tips, which are the market measures of inflation compensation, they actually look like inflation will be for the next 10 years somewhere around 2%, which is our target. Um, another way to look at it is just look at what the price inflation's been since before COVID to today. That's about 2.4%. And so when you see this notion of skyrocketing inflation, you have to stop and say, now, wait a second, we shut the economy down, we brought it back up. A lot of the things that are in inflation, like used car prices, which are up because you can't get a new car, or airline tickets, which are up because they came down so far, or car rental prices, which are at levels that who can even imagine because they have no rental cars. All those things are temporary. And most people expect, and I expect over time, they're going to moderate back to normal levels. Well, so, uh, and I know you've been speaking on this over the last couple of weeks, but you've been starting to outline a little bit, you're thinking about which decade are we in? Because mm -hmm. history teaches us several things, right? And different decades saw different types of inflation and different outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, which decade are we in? So I've had a lot of fun with this uh, because I think how you think about this year's price increases depends on what decade you think you're in. So you may think we're in the 70s and you'll remember in the 70s we had high and escalating inflation. You'll remember in the 70s we had gas lines, you know, which we even had uh, recently. Um, I will say it's kind of hard to imagine we've gotten to the 70s yet given how uh, transitory many of the price increases I just talked about, whether it be autos or uh, rental cars or uh, airline tickets seem to be. But that's one way of thinking about it. Uh, you could say we're in the 2000s, uh, where we had uh, low inflation for a while, but then it peaked up. The last, our inflation now is as high as it was since August 2008, and you know what happened the month after that, um, where we had a housing frenzy, which of course we've got today, uh, and you had you know elevated stock market and everything collapsed. So maybe you think we're in the 2000s, but then you have to look at bank capital and bank capital today is roughly 50% higher as a percent of assets as it was uh, in 2008. And the banks have done very well through this downturn. Some of you may think we're in the 2010s because we saw price pressure in 2011 uh, during a time of elevated asset purchases by the Fed. And a lot of people thought, oh my God, we're gonna see inflation there. And you might think we don't have to worry about it because inflation came down below 2% and pretty much stayed there. Or you might think we're in the 60s, right, where uh, we had a very stable situation, but um, you had a lot of fiscal spending, uh, you had a very accommodative Fed, and eventually you got the 70s. 
But I just remind you that part of that story were a few other things, like OPEC. Um, there were a few other things like wage and price controls. Uh, we actually stopped pegging uh, the dollar to gold uh, during that period. You had a pattern bargaining arrangement or situation where you had very high percentage coverage of unions, and you know, uh, uh, and their prices, their sorry, their wages were indexed to inflation. And you had a lot of regulated industries where their prices were indexed to inflation. So you could argue we're the 70s, but I mean the 60s. But again, there's a lot of other stuff that went on there. Um, it's, I have a lot of fun with it. I mean, you could argue this is the 90s and we're going to have a productivity boom, or it's the, the roaring 20s and maybe we ought to go out for a drink afterwards. So you can have fun with this. Um, I mean, where I, where I would end up is I'd take a good hard look at the late 40s because in the late 40s, we had a huge spike in inflation at the end of World War II as the economy tried to adjust from a wartime footing to a peacetime footing. And it feels to me the same today. We're just trying to adjust from a wartime footing, the war on COVID, uh, to a peacetime footing. And I just say, I, didn't, I knew it was strange when we shut the economy down, but who knew that it would be hard to reopen the economy? I mean, who knew that um, it doesn't just make sense to shut auto plants when you're in the middle of a pandemic, but you'd also shut auto plants at a time of the greatest auto sales that they've had in you know, 15 years? Who knew that theme parks would be running three days a week because you know, they couldn't get uh, labor. I talked about car rental uh, earlier. So who knew that reopening would be as hard as it's been? But it's it's been that hard. And I think we're just going to have an adjustment period to get to the other side of it. Well, I was going to ask you which decade is it? It sounds like a coin toss. But then so you've answered. Uh, uh, and what happened after the 1940s was an incredible period of boom. Um, you know, certainly we hope that pin up demand and, and uh, the short term issues we're dealing with leads to another period of boom. So, uh, you know, hopefully history does rhyme in this case. <laughs> It'd be, uh, it'd be good to avoid level. the Korean War and some of the other things. That came <laughs> some of those later. other issues. I'm sure there'll be other things, but pick and choose the various decades. Um, when you think, uh, you know, so there is that debate about: Are we at a temper? Is, is inflation temporary? Uh, the market seemed to have started to reconcile that we probably are, um, and I assume that would be your view as you think about uh, the coming 12 months. Well, I think you have to be humble about it. I mean, the the things you know for sure are we're having price pressure today. Another thing you know for sure is when these supply chain shortages end, prices are gonna come down. I think there's gonna be a period where the numbers actually go backwards rather than forward, and that won't be any more real than the supply chain shortages we're seeing now. Um, but how long those supply shortages will last, we don't know. And importantly, what happens to expectations in the period? Are um, those of us who you know, are used to increasing prices two or 3% a year in line with whatever our industry or sector protocol is, are we going to start doing that twice a year? Are we going to start doing that 5 or 6%? That's what happens when inflation escalates. And lots of us in the room do remember that's what happened in the late 60s and 70s. And so I think you have to be humble about it. Um, I do think that's why um, you're seeing in Washington uh, some sense that uh, additional fiscal would need to get funded. I think that's why you're seeing the Fed starting to discuss the normalization of policy. So, and when you say uh, inflation might go backward, I, you mean a lower rate, not right. necessarily negative, right? Or well, maybe I mean, by uh, math. When you look at the inflation numbers, they do month to month. So if car rental, I just do this because I tried to get a car in Traverse City last week and couldn't get one. But um, if it was $400 there, it's not going to be $400 forever. Yeah. And so when car rental prices come back down to 50 or 70, that's going to look like negative. It's, it's going to be a deflationary, not inflationary. Right. Well, it'll be an interesting headline to read about then. Um, so uh, I guess, but the risk, of course, is embedded expectations. Right. Um, so right now, the math makes inflation look higher than it is, but we are seeing, you know, pricing pressures. We're seeing uh, wages, the highest has been in 18 quarters uh, we're, or something like that. We're seeing um, uh, producers build in expectations mm -hmm. about higher pricing. So what, what, how do you manage the risk of embedded expectations that make inflation persist more than you, you expect? Well, I think, uh, so first of all, uh, wages are up, but they're just up sort of the way they were in 2019. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we've hit some you know, level like uh, the 60s. I think it is something you've got to watch very carefully. And uh, businesses are looking for a reassurance in the numbers. They're looking for reassurance that those people who are policymakers will make the policy choices that are needed to make sure you keep it. Uh, controlled. And I do think um, from a Fed standpoint, um, and certainly from a monetary policy economist standpoint, this notion of managing expectations uh, is a critical part of policy. It gives you the freedom to conduct policy the way we've been doing it if people stay 
embedded. And when I talk to businesses, what I'm constantly asking is that question. Not what are you doing to price this year, but how are you thinking this is going to change next year? Do you think the protocols of your sector or your industry are going to change because of what we're doing? And so far, I'm not hearing that uh, in any kind of mass. I hear people hearing a, a, uh, a one-time change mm -hmm. as opposed to a uh, long, but you've got to watch it. And I certainly am watching it. So I know you do, you're out talking to many CEOs and business leaders, civic leaders. Um, are, do they seem to be thinking along those lines then that it is temporary, a one-time event or what are they saying? It about? totally depends on what sector yeah. uh, you're in. Certainly the folks who are in construction who have been hit pretty hard by uh, lumber prices, by steel prices, by availability of workers, um, by incredible demand uh, for housing. Uh, you know, they're seeing prices increase. And their concern, I don't know how to put this, it wouldn't exactly be inflation. Their question is, at what point do people stop buying? Mm -hmm. At what point do prices get to a level where people back off? That's what you'd hear there. You could go to healthcare, you know, where I see Claire over there, education. I don't think people in education think, you know, we're going to a 7 8 or 9% inflationary environment. Those are big parts of the you know, economy too. So I think you have to go sector by sector mm -hmm. and see what they think. Yep, absolutely. Well, so we've been through a, a historic period. The economy is recovering. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that and what you're seeing now. I mean, obviously employment, strange times, right? I mean, in some sense, we've got unemployment at 6%, which has come down, I think, lower than if a year ago. I don't think most people would have expected that number. Um, and yet at the same time, unfilled jobs are very high. So the company's having a hard time finding people and we still got 6% unemployment. And we're still well below the employment levels we had pre-pandemic. So uh, what are your thoughts about where we are with unemployment? Yeah, so a couple numbers, uh, unemployment rates 5.8%. There are 7.6 fewer uh, million fewer people employed today than there were in February 2020. Mm -hmm. And everybody you talk to can't find workers. I mean, it's a, it's a mess. And in particular, um, lower wage workers. Uh, now, Part of this you just can easily explain. I mean, who knew in January that these vaccines would roll out as, as strongly as they have and been as effective as they have? How could you have, as a business person in January, planned for this kind of demand in April or May? So maybe you could uh, blame some of it on that. Uh, another thing you could easily uh, talk about is uh, parents who are home with kids, primary caregivers, um, saying, well, you know, I've still got to be home with the kids. The camp's not open or whatever. That's another piece of it. Um, we've had a surge in retirees. Retirements this year have been three times the normal pace. So that's another set of people off. And of course, you've had a lot of um, uh, extra savings in people's pockets as a result of the combination of stimulus checks, unemployment insurance, and suppressed spending during the, during the crisis. And so I think it must be the case that you've got a bunch of people on the sidelines who, are, uh, who have the funds to be choosy and to see uh, if I can't get a better job or maybe wait till September to get back in the workforce. Um, economists have a phrase called the reservation wage, which is, you know, at what wage do you need to come into the workforce? And um, the New York Fed actually does a metric of this, and it's increased like 25% in the last year, according to this metric. And when you think about it, it makes sense. I mean, we didn't pass a $15 minimum wage, but we talked a lot about a $15 minimum wage. At the same time, you've got Amazon and Target and Chipotle and McDonald's and a lot of big name people raising their wages and they either are raising it to 15 or they're raising it to an average of 15, which is a cute way of, you know, using the same number and getting there. And so if you had an $11 job, why would you take it? Why, why wouldn't you take a couple more weeks and try to find a $15 job? So I think that is what's happening actually at some breadth in the economy. And uh, I've called it a clog. It's sort of clogged. Now, presumably, hopefully, by the time we get to September, uh, summer's over, people back in school. I think you'll see the workforce expand again, and we'll start to fill some of these uh, jobs. But that's the, you know, when I describe a 1946 economy, that's what I'm talking about. It's constrained today. Think about people coming back from Europe after World War II, but eventually they'll be in the workforce. And when they are Hopefully it'll open up again. Yeah, no, it'd be great. Well, so as you see people returning to work and what we're learning coming out of the pandemic, is the, is the composition of the labor force changing in a meaningful way or um, maybe share a little thoughts on that? Well, I mean, we've got as a country a demographic challenge and most uh, developed world countries have this. We're actually better than uh, most. Fertility has dropped. And so, you know, growth of the workforce has dropped. Um, 
you know, my generation is retiring and the baby boomers disproportionately are leaving the workforce in ways that don't, aren't fully uh, replaced. Immigration, uh, which was a big uh, support to growth for many, many years has slowed. And so you just have a fundamental size of workforce uh, challenge. You might then say there's an uncertainty about how will primary caregivers live their lives differently post COVID? Will people reassess their lives and leave the workforce? Will parents decide to spend more time? You know, who, who knows on that one? But I think you've got a real supply shortage over the medium term coming if, if and when demand comes back as strongly as I'm thinking it will. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I know Raphael's talked a lot about inclusive growth and the mm -hmm. Fed's commitment to that. Maybe just give a just quick overview of what you are doing there in that regard. Well, again, just to ground it in a couple numbers, um, the best way I think to look at um, uh, inclusion in the workforce is employment to population of prime age workers. What percent of prime age workers are in the workforce? And what you find is in most uh, suburbs and prosperous parts of cities uh, and exurbs, that number is 10 to 12% higher than it is in most rural areas or in most inner cities. So prime age workforce, you've got 10 to, you know, think of it as 72% versus 60% employed and in the workforce. And so on the positive side, that's a huge opportunity, right? Because if we could get those folks into the workforce, that helps solve some of the growth problem I was just talking about. On the other hand, it's a real dichotomy that we've got to spend time uh, working on. In our district, we have a lot of small towns. And so we've put a lot of investment into this question of what's happening in small towns that isn't happening uh, in the big cities. No surprise, a big part of it is uh, education. No surprise, a big part of it is uh, health and addiction. Uh, but there's a pretty interesting uh, second order set of things I'll put around isolation and connection. Uh, if all of the banks and all of the hospitals have left your small town, why would you ever aspire to be a banker or a doctor? Right? And I think there's a real opportunity to sort of bring, and maybe remote can help with that, to help bring uh, better connections uh, to jobs, to careers, to prospects, to people in the smaller towns, and I think equally in the inner cities. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, I want to make sure you're good. Since we got started 10 minutes late, we may go 10 minutes late. Are, are you good past 1 o'clock? We're coming up close on that. Oh, yeah. Totally. Okay, good. All right, great. Um, maybe two more questions for me, and then we will open it up to uh, your questions, um, and and you can ask Tom, and I think we may have a way of doing some online questioning too, so we'll get to that. Um, one thing, you know, so productivity has been something that is a big uh, influencer of inflation, and for the last 20 years, productivity has kept inflation at bay, or at least played an important mm -hmm. role. Um, does that continue? And what are your thoughts about how productivity uh, continues, and, and is that a, a key variable for managing inflation? Sure. I mean, uh, and again, ground you in the numbers. Uh, we had very strong productivity, you know, into the 90s and the early 2000s. It really took a step back for the next 10 or 15 years. Um, and it's hard to know because these numbers are revised all the time. But over the last two or three years, it looks like it started to come back. And certainly the stats from the last year would suggest it has. You know, I just point to we have a great culture of innovation in this country. I think that continues. Um, you can't hang out with your kids for 10 seconds without seeing the amazing impact technology is having on, well, it's not making them more productive, but that's another issue, um, uh, you know, on, on what we can do in society. And so I, and look at what we've just been through with COVID and what we can get done. So I think there's a real opportunity there. You know, the lesson of the 90s was though, because, you know, personal computers came in the 80s. We didn't really see the productivity until uh, 10 years later. What does it take to make us more productive? How do you train new technology? Artificial intelligence is the same thing not just how do you implement it, but how does it get implemented in a way that you actually can get the results on the back end? And I could imagine we're all gonna go to hybrid. I appreciate the, those of you who are uh, videoed in today. Will that work? Will it be more productive? Or are we gonna end up having meetings two or three times? I think there's a lot of uncertainty about where this is going. I know that technology will make us more productive in time. I just don't know how fast. Right. Well, speaking of innovation, you, know, uh, you open the headlines, it's either about inflation or it's about Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, let's we don't have to talk about Bitcoin, but let's think about digital currencies, because it does have a big influence over the next 20 years about, you know, the, the payment system you're overseeing. So um, how do you how do you think about the, the world of digital currencies and how is how does that potentially change or when does it change? How does it dislocate? And you only get two minutes to answer, um, uh, you know, the, the system that we have in place today. I mean, just broadly. OK, uh, so, <laughs> so, the, so the Fed has said uh, that we're going to be publishing a paper in the next uh, couple months on digital currencies and what the role would be. I think, and so I won't try to front run that too much, but I will say 
that we already have a digital currency, you know, in this country, it's called the dollar. Um, I've got 40 in my pocket and I've got a lot more in the bank. And so, you know, I pay things by Venmo. I pay my bills online. We have a digital currency. So if you're going to enhance the digital currency of the U.S., you have to decide um, for what reason. And the reasons that are put on the table are complicated. I mean, one reason that's put on the table is international transactions. And I would be the first to agree if you travel internationally, those are not efficient transactions. It's not obvious to me you have to introduce a whole new currency uh, to do that. But, you know, you could probably solve that. Remittances, same sort of thing. Um, uh, some people would say uh, China is introducing a digital currency. We can't get behind China. I guess I would just remind you the reason China wants to do a digital currency is because they want to track every transaction. I mean, that's how it works in China. And I don't think that's a saleable element of a digital currency in the U.S. There's some people who think a digital currency would make sense in the U.S. because um, uh, it would allow the Fed to have individual accounts for everybody and you wouldn't have to go to a bank. And uh, we'd have to think about it. It doesn't strike me that, you know, disintermediating the banking system is exactly what we're trying to do right now, but that would be the impact of it. And so you just got to think through what are you trying, what problem are you trying to solve here? Mm -hmm. And how do you do it? It's certainly doable to have a digital currency, whether it be one you put through the banks or one you did separately, you could tokenize it, however you decided to, just, to design it. But I think we ought to have a sense of what are we trying to accomplish when we do it? And that's the piece I still haven't heard a good story about what we're trying to accomplish. Right, yeah, still to, still to be developed and told. On top of the digital currency that's already in my bank account. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, well, good job answering that <laughs> broad question. Um, well, uh, I'd like to open it up to the floor and see if we have any questions from any of you all. Um, you know, I've got a couple others as well, but uh, Joe? Uh, Tom, we're hearing a lot about infrastructure at the moment. From your point of view, what are the elements of infrastructure that you see being the most impactful on the revival of the economy? Well, I, I think uh, there's a, a pretty broad-based consensus that uh, you know, roads, bridges, buildings, schools, you know, ports, that all those places we need to invest. I think the most interesting challenge is when I talk to manufacturers and construction people, they can't find workers. And they're not saying they can't find workers because they're on unemployment insurance or because they're home with the kids or because they retire. They're saying they can't find workers because they don't have people with skills. And so I do think we need to think hard about how we build a stronger, bigger, healthier infrastructure workforce. Uh, in our country. I think that's actually the big part that's not talked about enough on the infrastructure side. We don't have enough plumbers, welders, carpenters. We need more plumbers, welders. And, and if we can do that and build back America's infrastructure at the same time, awesome. I just, I do worry if we don't work the infrastructure thing, we're going to create a lot more demand without doing anything to elevate the supply. Zach. Well, I think a little bit of this comes back to how we think about it, which is broad-based over a zillion sectors. Um, uh, first of all, minimum wage, uh, first of all, we haven't increased the minimum wage. Were we to do so, um, it would increase the compensation level of a number of industries. But actually, mostly those industries that are disproportionately lower wage people. So I was in consulting for a long time. Minimum wage wouldn't change our cost structure you know, one iota, but it certainly will change McDonald's, right? Just to, you know, give the breadth. So it's a small part of the economy, not the entire economy. And it's a small part of a lot of businesses. But those businesses that do have those cost increases, I think will then try to pass them on. And there is always a question of what you can pass on and what you can't pass on. I think it's easiest to pass it on if it is a minimum wage, because you can turn to your customers and say, basically not my fault as opposed to you know, trying to go into a big box retailer and make the case that you unilaterally increased your wages and now you need higher prices. They may say, you know, go home. So uh, I think it would increase pricing eventually in those uh, sectors. But then remember the dynamism of the economy. The next thing that's going to happen is people are going to start investing in automation, right? You already see in a lot of these retailers self-checkout. I was in CVS the other day, you know, at some scale. Um, or substitution, depending on the type of worker, into other places. So it will affect costs, which eventually affect prices. But to affect inflation at the side of the entire economy, you've got to work that all the way. You've got to work that all the way through. How do you respond to uh, the question that 
question about uh, real inflation is higher when you look at asset pricing, housing, stocks, things like that, than when you track um, quantitative easing, artificially low interest rates are cause of that to actually exacerbate the wealth gap. So there were a few questions in there. I'll try to I'll try to unpack them. Um, I, look, I think it's fair to say housing prices are up, and you know other asset prices are up. And the fact that they're not measured in the inflation stats shouldn't mean you ignore them. Um, by the way, there are lots of other things that aren't measured in the inflation stats. And as a guy who was in business for 30 years before I came in, I came in with a very strong hypothesis that we were measuring inflation wrong, and that was part of the story. And having dug into it a lot, I mean, a it's really complicated. And B, I think they're doing a pretty good job of measuring inflation. And so you could play around with it. You know, housing does end up through uh, what's called owner-occupied rents. And so there, there's some connection of the housing market into pricing. Maybe it could be better. Anything could be better. But I don't think they're doing a terrible job of measuring. And when you get to the inequality thing, there's a lot of debate about this. Um, when you do asset purchases, as we're doing, or you keep rates low, um, clearly that has some impact on asset valuations. And so one could argue that, those who have assets are disproportionately wealthy, and those with assets get wealthier when that happens. Um, on the other hand, when you stimulate the economy, it's also clear you bring the last people in from the sidelines into the workforce. And so it's not a A or B issue. It's how do you feel about you know, getting people off the fringes into the economy and temporarily increasing some asset valuations? And I think the inequality trade's not bad there because once people get into the workforce, studies show that they tend to stay in the workforce. And, you know, when it comes to assets, what comes up must go down. And so when we normalize rates in the back end of it, those asset valuations go back to normal and the people over here still have a job. That's how I think about it. Uh, Bill Bowling, and then I want to come over here and make sure I'm getting everybody. Hey, Bill. Here. Great to see you again. Uh, a number of us have been working on affordable housing. You mentioned this earlier, food and housing being important. Rafael Bosnick has been tremendously available to us. The dialogue and the research of the bank has been so helpful to us. What can the bank do to help? We're five, to, depending on who's measuring, nine million units short right now of housing, um, and we all need to play a role. So I'd just be interested in your yeah. opinion. Yeah, I might, I might kick you to Raphael on this question since he has a PhD in affordable housing and he was in the Housing and Urban Development Administration. He's very passionate about the topic, so I'd be a little arrogant to try to beat up on Raphael on this. But, um, I mean, it's clearly the case uh, that as the price of housing goes up, you've got real issues in affordability. And when the cost goes up, it's hard to build uh, replacements. In our bank, sorry, in our bank, what we're trying to do uh, is invest alongside affordable housing leaders in the kind of research that would be useful uh, to help get legislation passed that increase the flow of funds into this market. Because in the end, this is just Tom speaking, I won't speak for Raphael here. Um, I think this is a money problem. And the reason we don't have more units is that it's been more economic for developers and others to invest in different types of units. And so you've got to make them economic. And that's not something that we have the money to solve or that most cities have the money to solve. It's something that's got to be solved you know, on a grander scale. But again, I think I should defer to Raphael, who knows that stuff a lot better than I do. Uh, time for one more question. Dennis, Matt, best Matt, for last. Yeah, well, this is, now this is intimidating. The guy who got me into the federal <laughs> world, is our world all together. There we go. Tom, I can't let you get away without asking the pregnant question. What's your base case outlook for policy? Lift off and, and taper. Um, so this is like a fishing test where Dennis wants to see if I'm actually going to answer the question or not. <laughs> um, so uh, the Fed's doing two things right now. We're doing uh, some significant asset purchases, and we've got rates at zero, and we've given forward guidance that'll be at zero for a while. Our forward guidance, we've been very explicit on both of those. For asset purchases, we'd say we would do that until we see substantial further progress against our mandated goals. And um, at the time we said that, Employment to population was roughly 57. It had been 61 before. Inflation was roughly 1.6. I told you earlier, it's, it's now over our target. And so I think it's pretty clear to me that we have had substantial further progress against our inflation goal. And the question is, we're now at about 58.3 on employment to population. When do we get, if we were at 57 and now we're at 58, and we used to be at 61, 
when do you get to substantial progress? I'm pretty optimistic about uh, the labor market. We'll see what happens. But if the labor market you know, opens as I suggested it might, then I think we're going to get there in relatively short order. But it's totally conditional on what happens uh, in the labor market. On rates, we've said we'll stay at zero until liftoff will be when uh, inflation hits our target. Again, you could argue we're there. Um, uh, uh, we hit maximum employment. And remember, we're at 5.8%, or if you look at a broader number, you know, even further away, that's probably sometime, you know, out there, depending on how fast the labor market goes. And until inflation looks like it's going to sustain at 2%. And so, again, I've talked to you about this dislocation period we're having this year. I kind of think let's look at it next year and see what happens. And if the numbers hit, great. If they don't, you know, we've got time because it'll show there's still more room for the economy uh, to grow. Well, and it's a great question to end on. And, um, you know, so it, tapering really is kind of two phases. One, buying less in the market per month. And then two, the actual changing of the interest rate. And, and uh, I think a lot of people get that confused sometimes or think it happens faster than it really does. Um, I mean, as you've articulated, you've, you've got time to kind of work that through and, and observe and see how things evolve. Well, you know, keeping rates at zero keeps rates low. Uh, buying assets presumably keeps rates low. You kind of would prefer to sequence them yep. because you don't really want to be, you know, buying assets and keeping rates low while you're raising rates. That's a sort of a mixed message. So, to the extent it's feasible, you'd love to sequence them. Um, they did sequence them the last time mm -hmm. when Dennis and his colleagues did a brilliant job of leading policy, and we'll see how we do this time. Well, uh, uh, well, well, we'll look forward to seeing how that evolves and, and uh, your guidance there through uh, through the months. So that's great. Well, uh, any other questions? I mean, with that uh, that pretty much wraps for us on time. We went a little bit over, and thank you for your time I'm there. I mean, maybe just, you know, just closing question as you think about uh, you know coming out of the pandemic and things you've observed and talking to people. Is there anything you think that our communities and our society is doing well that you would like to see stick and continue to do? That is kind of an innovation coming out of the pandemic, or uh, or is it too early to tell? Well, I really like my Chick-fil-A app. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, so, so I might say, um, I think the market, so, so there's a lot of talk about how the world's going to be different or not in the future. Are people going to come back to work or work from home, hybrid or not? I, I would just say the market really hasn't had a say in this yet. And I talk to people whose you know, salespeople have been just as productive being from home. And I go, well, what are you going to do the first time you lose a sale to a competitor who took your customer out to dinner. And I kind of go, yeah, I'm probably going to go out there in person again. And, you know, I talked to 25 year olds who have just bought a dog and love working from home. And I go, well, how are you going to build a network? And, you know, how are you going to build relationships in your life? They're going to give you other opportunities. By the same token, I talked to employers who are going to bring everybody back. And I said, well, how's it going to play out if you start, you know, being unable to price competitively with someone who no longer owns real estate. I don't know what it's going to happen, but I'm just pretty confident the market hasn't yet voted yet. And I think five years from now, the market will have voted and we'll know a lot better, you know, what, what sticks and what's great and what doesn't. Yeah. Well, Tom, thank you very much for your time no, today. To be Fascinating here. discussion. Thank you.